Welcome back to our channel. In today's video, we're diving deep into the world of cardiology as we uncover the telltale signs of a STEMI, also known as ST elevation myocardial infarction on an ECG. We'll explore the science behind ECG and walk you through the ECG patterns that signify a STEMI. Let's dive in. As we begin our journey into understanding STEMI on ECG, let's first talk about what a transbural infarction actually is. Picture this, your heart is working tirelessly day and night, pumping oxygen-rich blood to your body. And to keep up with its heavy workload, the heart needs a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients, which it gets through the coronary arteries. A transmural infarction occurs when there is a complete blockage in one of these arteries, leading to the death of the full thickness of the heart muscle wall in the affected area. This can cause severe damage to the heart and may even result in life-threatening complications if not treated immediately. That's where ECG come in handy. Electrocardiograms, or ECG for short, are an essential diagnostic tool for detecting STEMI. They provide a real-time visual representation of the electrical activity within the heart, making it possible to identify the signature patterns associated with a transbural infarction. To further our understanding of myocardial ischemia and infarction, we need to take a closer look at the myocardial blood supply. The heart receives oxygenated blood from the coronary arteries and their branches. There are three main coronary arteries, the right coronary artery, the left anterior descending coronary artery, and the left circumflex coronary artery. The right coronary artery is responsible for supplying blood to the inferior or diaphragmatic portion of the heart as well as the right ventricle. The left main coronary artery divides into the left anterior descending coronary artery, which typically supplies the ventricular septum and a significant part of the left ventricular free wall, and the left circumflex coronary artery, which supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Myocardial infarctions tend to be localized to the region of the left ventricle that's supplied by one of these arteries or their branches. In the next scene, we'll discuss how these infarctions affect the ECG and its different phases. Transmural myocardial infarction is characterized by ischemia and ultimately necrosis of a portion of the entire or nearly the entire thickness of the left ventricular wall. Patients who present with acute myocardial infarction typically have underlying atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. The pathophysiology of acute ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or STEMI and the subsequent evolving Q-wave myocardial infarction most often relates to the occlusion of one of the coronary arteries due to a ruptured atherosclerotic plaque followed by the formation of a clot at this site. The clot in the so-called culprit artery is composed of platelets and fibrin, blocking blood flow downstream. Other factors, such as cocaine use, coronary artery dissections, coronary emboli, and other factors can also cause or contribute to acute STEMI. Large transmural myocardial infarctions generally produce changes in both myocardial depolarization, seen in the QRS complex, and myocardial repolarization, seen in the STT complex. The earliest ECG changes observed with acute transmural ischemia or infarction typically occur in the STT complex in sequential phases. In the next scene, we'll delve into these sequential phases and their ECG manifestations. Now that we understand the basics of ST segment elevation, transmural ischemia, and acute myocardial infarction, let's explore the sequential phases of ECG changes that occur in STEMI. There are two main phases. The acute phase is characterized by the appearance of ST segment elevations and sometimes tall positive or hyperacute T waves in multiple leads, typically two or more. This phase is referred to as STEMI. The evolving phase takes place hours or days later and is marked by deep T wave inversions in the leads that previously exhibited ST elevations. Transmural myocardial infarctions can also be described in terms of the location of the infarct. Anterior refers to the involvement of the anterior or lateral wall of the left ventricle, whereas inferior indicates the involvement of the inferior or diaphragmatic wall of the left ventricle. The anatomic location of the infarct determines the leads in which typical ECG patterns appear. For example, with an acute anterior wall myocardial infarction, the ST segment elevations and tall hyperacute T waves appear in one or more of the anterior leads which are chest leads V1 to V6 and extremity leads D1 and a VL. 
Conversely, with an inferior wall myocardial infarction, the ST segment elevations and tall hyperacute T waves are seen in the inferior leads D2, D3, and a VF. As we continue to analyze ECG changes in STEMI, it's crucial to understand the concept of reciprocal changes. These changes can provide valuable insights into the diagnosis of myocardial infarctions. Reciprocal changes refer to the fact that the anterior and inferior leads often display inverse patterns. In the case of an anterior infarction with ST segment elevations, in two or more of the leads V1 to V6, D1, and a VL, ST segment depression is frequently observed in leads D2, D3, and a VF. On the other hand, with an acute inferior wall infarction, leads D2, D3, and a VF exhibit ST segment elevation, while reciprocal ST depressions are often seen in one or more of the leads V1 to V3, D1, and a VL. The ST segment elevation associated with acute myocardial infarction is known as the current of injury, which indicates that damage has occurred to the epicardial or outer layer of the heart due to severe ischemia. The exact reasons that acute myocardial infarction produces ST segment elevation are complex and not fully understood. Normally, the ST segment is isoelectric, meaning that no net current flow is occurring at this time. Myocardial infarction alters the electrical charge on the myocardial cell membranes in several ways, resulting in abnormal current flow or current of injury, which then produces ST segment deviations. Now let's discuss the various shapes and appearances of ST segment elevation seen in acute myocardial infarction. The ST segment may be plateau-shaped, dome-shaped, or obliquely elevated. These different forms of ST segment elevation are important to recognize in order to accurately diagnose acute myocardial infarction. The ST segment elevations and reciprocal ST depressions are the earliest ECG signs of infarction and are generally seen within minutes of blood flow occlusion. Tall, positive, or hyperacute T waves may also be present at this time. In some cases, hyperacute T waves can precede the ST elevations. Strict criteria for determining whether ST segment and J point elevations are due to acute ischemia are limited because of false positives and false negatives. However, it is crucial for clinicians to be aware that ST changes in acute ischemia may evolve with the patient under observation. If the initial ECG is not diagnostic of STEMI, but the patient continues to have symptoms consistent with myocardial ischemia, serial ECG at 5 to 10 minute intervals, or continuous 12 lead ST segment monitoring should be performed. As we discussed earlier, the evolving phase of infarction is characterized by deep T wave inversions in the leads that previously displayed ST segment elevations. This phase usually occurs hours or even a few days after the acute phase. During the evolving phase, the elevated ST segments start to return to the baseline and simultaneously, the T waves become inverted in leads that showed ST segment elevations before. With an anterior wall infarction, the T waves become inverted in one or more of the anterior leads, such as V1 to V6, D1, and a VL. In the case of an inferior wall infarction, the T waves become inverted in one or more of the inferior leads, like D2, D3, and a VF. Recognizing these evolving T-wave inversions is vital to understanding the progression of myocardial infarction and making accurate diagnoses. These changes provide crucial information about the stage of the infarction and can guide clinical decision-making and patient management. Myocardial infarction, especially when large and transmural, often produces distinct changes in the QRS complex. The most characteristic of these changes is the appearance of new Q-waves. In case you're wondering why certain myocardial infarctions lead to Q-waves, let's refresh our memory about what a Q-wave is. It is simply an initial negative deflection of the QRS complex. If the entire QRS complex is negative, it is referred to as a QS complex. Now, what happens during a transmural infarction? Necrosis of heart muscle occurs in a localized area of the ventricle. As a result, the electrical voltages produced by this portion of the myocardium disappear. Instead of positive R waves over the infarcted area, Q waves are often recorded, either as a QR or QS complex. However, it's important to understand that not all transmural infarcts lead to Q waves, and not all Q wave infarcts correlate with transmural necrosis. 
Thus, abnormal Q waves serve as characteristic markers of infarction, signifying the loss of positive electrical voltages caused by the death of heart muscle. The new Q waves of a myocardial infarction generally appear within the first day or so of the infarct. Their appearance in different leads can help us determine the location of the infarction. We have anterior wall Q wave infarctions, inferior wall infarctions, posterior infarctions, and right ventricular infarctions. Recognizing these patterns can help us understand the severity and extent of the infarction and guide us in the treatment. It is crucial to differentiate between normal and abnormal Q waves since not all Q waves are indicators of MI. Normal septal Q waves are characteristically narrow and of low amplitude, while abnormal Q waves may occur in leads such as lead of VL, leads D3, and a VF. In conclusion, Q waves of infarction can help us better understand the extent and nature of myocardial infarctions. Their significance in clinical practice cannot be overstated. By studying these waves and their characteristics, we can develop effective strategies to diagnose and manage our patients with myocardial infarction. Thank you for taking the time to learn with us today. Please share this video with your colleagues, subscribe to our channel, and give us a positive evaluation. We hope to see you soon in our next video.